Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features The Uncanny X-Men number 282, cover dated November 1991. So, as the cover uh, text makes plain, his name is Bishop and nothing will ever be the same. So, this is the first appearance of Bush Bishop um, on cover and, as it turns out, just on the last page. So, it's the next issue that we really do learn who this new character is and um, why he has come, as it turns out, from the future to the present. So uh, the cover here by Wills Portacio, Bishop's creator. Um, Portacio originally wanted Bishop to be um, Filipino, but the uh, marketing department in Marvel insisted that he be uh, black as the X-Men uh, comics had um, a big black readership and uh, not too many black characters at the time. And many years later, Chris Claremont established that um, Bishop was um, Aboriginal, um, Australian. And also on the cover here are Malcolm and Randall, uh, Bishop's two companions, um, who don't last very long as it turns out. Pretty dynamic cover, love the colors on this. Always love uh, the use of magenta here on um, these 1980s, 1990s uh, covers. Let's open this one up and, uh, oh yeah, one last thing. The uh, corner box there, we've got headshots of the X-Men Gold Team, um, all of which are by Jim Lee. So let's open this one up now. And um, the story opens in uh, the rebuilt X-Mansion. Just something I observed about Portacio's version of the X-Mansion is it's quite squat. Uh, really, these side wings should be much longer. Um, and uh, there's a lot of text on this page uh, to do with uh, Professor X's chess game with um, Forge here, which uh, Professor X wins. And it turns out Forge has built into the uh, chessboard a sidekick damper that had been giving Professor X a headache for the last hour while they were playing their game. But they have a laugh over it because Forge was worried that maybe Professor X would use his telepathy to cheat. Um, so nicely uh, drawn and very detailed art here from um, Portacio. And then we turn over the page for a double page half splash um, featuring the arrival of the X-Men uh, goal team from the end of the previous issue with an injured apparently dead Jean Grey. And uh, Storm here uses her power to blow over to forge um, one of the sentinels that they destroyed at the end of the previous issue. These new sentinels of Trevor Fitzroy's for forge to study. So nicely uh, drawn uh, work here by Portacio, of course. And our creative team, Wills Portacio, plotter, penciler, Art T-Bear, inker, John Byrne, scripter, Dana Morshead, colorist, and Tom Orzakowski uh, on letters. So um, we get a little recap on what happened at the end of the previous issue, where Storm says, um, there was another involved, a mutant, a stranger. He did not seem to be in league with Pierce. That's a reference to Fitzroy. In the end, we prevailed against the Sentinels and the stranger fled, taking the Hellfire Club's White Queen with him. And uh, the editorial note here, not quite what you saw last issue, but take our word for it, it's what happened. And yes, that's right, because at the end of the previous issue, Fitzroy just disappeared. So we, don't, we, we never found out that he took uh, the White Queen's body with him. So Professor X uh, is baffled by this because, as he says here, I'm psychically attuned to you, all of you, my X-Men. I would have uh, felt her die. I must probe further. If there any, is any trace of Jean, yes, she's not dead. Her psyche survives, but it is displaced. So a little mystery there. Jean is alive, but not in this body. So interesting um, art technique here. The color hold here is suggesting um, background skyscrapers of New York City. Um, nicely done. And then we have uh, Shinobi Shaw, who we saw in the previous issue being visited while he's asleep by Trevor Fitzroy with the um, comatose White Queen and the remains of uh, Donald Pierce. And this is all in reference to this game that these characters, the upstarts, Shinobi Shaw is one of them and, Tri and Fitzroy is a new member um, of the upstarts are playing in order to determine who is their leader and maybe it, it will turn out ultimately that there's a prize in the offing, but he has come 
for simply uh, this ring that um, uh, grants him leadership of the upstarts, as he says here. And we learn during this that Jean has uh, put her psyche into Emma's uh, body. So as she thinks here, uh, oh, Jean, what have you gotten yourself into? Um, and at the end of this little scene, um, Fitzroy basically cuts, it seems, Shinobi Shaw's um, finger off in order to get the ring, which uh, Shaw's not willing to give him. And then we go back to the X-Mansion and we have the fruits of or the results of uh, Forge's examination of the Sentinel head here. We've got some more color holes going on in the background here. And basically, the only thing he can learn is the location of the Sentinel's base, which is up in the Arctic Circle, and that their base is disguised as an iceberg. So basically, the X-Men decide to uh, uh, go there, and um, Professor X insists on accompanying them uh, too, because as he says, uh, Jean will need his help to free herself uh, from the body. Um, that she is um, inhabiting, that's um, Emma's body. So then our scene switches to uh, the Arctic Circle, um, above the Arctic Circle and the iceberg in question. And then this turns out to be Trevor Fitzroy's base. We have the introduction to one of his um, assistants here, this character um, called Bantam, as it turns out. And we get to learn um, something about Fitzroy's powers in um, the coming pages how his mutant power is that he can uh, uses the life force of other people in order to open these portals which are one-way portals from the future and one of these portals opens up without his um, volition and um, emerge and there emerges from it this uh, um, melded uh, two, two people who've uh, melded together and who aren't dead yet um, they're fused into a single mass by the transition. So what we get here is visually something that recalls uh, John Carpenter's The Thing, um, that movie with, uh, I think it's 1981 with um, 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 Kurt Russell. And, um, and basically Shaw absorbs the life energy from this creature. He can't get any other information from them. And then he berates Bantam for uh, not having um, catalogued and monitored all of his portals sufficiently to avoid this um, accident happening. And Bantam here thinks, you'd make my life easier if you would be more frugal in the use of your power. One day you may open one of your time portals and, what, and the devil only knows what will come out of it. And that proves ominous in terms of something that does emerge from one of uh, um, Fitzroy's portals at the end of this issue that he wasn't expecting. So here we have the arrival of the X-Men in their blackboard bird, and we have Professor X here, who is now um, certain of his deduction that Jean transferred her uh, psyche into the mind of the nearest te telepath, which would have been Emma Frost. Now, just something to note in terms of the lettering on this page, and I'm not blaming Tom Ozakowski for this, but the way that this reads, we would uh, naturally read uh, this um, speech balloon here, which is Forge, and then we have Professor X's response, and then our eye naturally goes to this balloon here, but actually we should be heading over here, because uh, this is the next part of Professor X's speech, and all along here, and then up to here, where he uh, responds to Forge's point in this speech balloon. So really this is down to Portacio's uh, art here that he's not leaving enough room in this particular panel um, to get all the dialogue in. Um, but in addition, I think some blame could be laid at the door of John Byrne who, in my opinion, is overwriting uh, the dialogue and captions in this issue. Um, some would say that he's doing so in order to uh, explain some of Portacio's plotting, but I think he, he, he's overdoing it and all of this could be reduced down into snappier um, dialogue that would still get the points across. And then we see into um, uh, another aspect of uh, Fitzroy's headquarters where he's got all the Hellions um, imprisoned 
and he is uh, drawing out their life force in order to open one of his portals. That's his power. But it turns out that Taro wasn't killed um, in the previous issue because this is her and he is um, ha um, half draining her, her of her life force in order to open this particular one-way uh, time portal. And there emerges from it these criminals that he's freed um, on condition that they uh, swear allegiance to him. But this particular one, Kroger, is minded to uh, be free, master of his own destiny, and he is not going to uh, serve Fitzroy and threatens to uh, take him on uh, with his powers. So Fitzroy basically says, by all means leave, I release you from your word. In fact, take the portal by now, the other end will have shifted from your point of origin. So this guy Kroger goes through, but he's been tricked um, and he is um, destroyed. As Fitzroy says here in his explanatory dialogue, these are one-way portals. Any attempt to pass back through them and they extract the necessary energy from the most immediate source. So then what happens is Jean in Emma Frost's body makes her move. So she attacks um, Fitzroy, uh, his mercenaries psychically, but she also uses her uh, telekinetic powers, which uh, shocks Fitzroy because as he says here, Frost, you can't do that. You're nothing more than a telepath. So um, what happens in the meantime too is that Professor X senses that Jean is under attack, that the X-Men must hasten, and so they drop out of the Blackbird. But they've got a plan um, that they've worked out um, for uh, this particular attack on the Sentinels um, and Fitzroy. Um, a nice um, almost splash page here by um, Portacio. And let's get past this center page ad insert and back to uh, the comic itself. And um, so this is a nice panel here of um, Storm using her powers uh, to blast into um, the, uh, the defensive shell of the base. And inside, Jean continues her attack also on the mercenaries while she's defending herself. And then uh, Fitzroy gets the warning about the unauthorized aircraft detected earlier. It has deployed mutant units to attack this facility. And that, of course, is the X-Men. So here they are blasting their way in. This is Storm blasting her way in. And now we've got the X-Men who've arrived. Um, and a pretty action-packed page, this one, um, by uh, Portacio. So uh, Fitzroy doesn't know what's going on or how it could be the case uh, that he is um, about to lose here, as it seems. And uh, then the plan is for Colossus and Archangel to take out the Sentinels and for Iceman to freeze them before they can self-repair. And you can see here, I'll just open this page a bit better for you to see the uh, art. Uh, really dynamic uh, penciling and storytelling by uh, Portacio here. Lots of action um, in the previous issue on this one. And then Fitzroy on this page, basically he uses his power to drain the life force of all the imprisoned Hellions uh, before the X-Men can do anything about it. And he uses that power to open a portal through which stream a bunch more of uh, these criminals from the future. Um, and, and just something I want to note here is at this point and on this particular splash page, I am pretty sure that this one is um, perhaps not inked by um, Art T-Bear. Um, it may be um, that there's an assistant working on this one. Um, and certainly, I'm absolutely certain that this is not inked by Art uh, T-Bear. This is somebody else inking this one. Um, the style is different. I'm not able to identify who it is. Um, the lines are that bit thicker on this page and the rendering of Colossus's metallic skin is very different from T-Bear's uh, style of doing it. So there's somebody else inking this page. 
And similarly with the next couple of pages, um, where I think that it might even be Portacio who's inking himself, um, maybe in particular on the very last page. So what happens here is that we've got the X-Men taking on these criminals from the future. So another splash page by Portacio. And then we've got Fitzroy uh, laughing that uh, he's got more surprises up his sleeve for the X-Men, but then he himself ironically is surprised as his uh, guardian sentinels are destroyed from behind and something and someone emerges from the portal that he exactly wasn't expecting. And we turn to our final page full splash and it is the arrival of Bishop. And Bishop says, this little game of yours just got a whole lot deadlier. So, and in the next issue, we're gonna get some answers in terms of who this is, who the guys are, and um, a little bit more about Fitzroy and the future that he comes from. So, a dynamic um, entry for this new X-Men character, Bishop, the last of the new X-Men characters of the late 80s, early 90s, um, along with Gambit, Jubilee, um, uh, Cable, and of course the uh, ninja version of Psylocke, Bishop here. So I do hope that you enjoyed my review and commentary on this issue of Uncanny X-Men, number 282. Just one last thing I wanna show you before I close out the video, and that is that I have in my possession a CGC 9.8 uh, uh, graded version of the issue. And um, just one thing to note about this is that the color on uh, the cover is, I'll just move this over so you can see it, I hope, is a little bit darker, in particular Bishop's skin color. He's a darker shade of brown on this, and uh, the flesh colors on uh, Malcolm and Randall's arms are darker as well. So my little theory is that this came off the press earlier than this one where the colors are a little bit lighter. Um, so interesting these variations um, in terms of the lightness or darkness of the coloring um, on um, some of these issues uh, from, um, from the late 80s and 90s. Um, so I do hope that you enjoyed this review of Uncanny X-Men 282. If you did, please like the video. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.